Um, so welcome everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, we'll just do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, this presentation is being recorded and post, and it will be posted online and it's also being streamed to the Washington College Pre-Health Professions Facebook page. So if you wanna be sure um, to not be on camera, um, you can turn your camera off or probably already off um, and leave it off. Um, obviously that's not true for our speaker. You have to leave yours on, I'm sorry. We'll also be taking questions at the end, which you can type into the chat. We do ask that you keep yourself muted during the presentation, but you may unmute yourself for follow-up questions later on. Our presentation tonight is entitled Trailblazing a COVID-19 Response. Our guest is Vanessa McCarowitz, Washington College Class of 2002. Vanessa is currently the Infection Prevention and Control Manager at University of Washington Medicine, Harborview Medical Center in Seattle. Harborview was one of the first hospitals in the United States to implement COVID-19 response protocols in January 2020. Many of Harborview's initial protocols laid the groundwork for facilities nationwide, including the CDC. While a student at Washington College, Vanessa was a member of the swim team. Kim Lassard told me I had to mention that. Vanessa also carried a double major in biology and environmental studies and minored in Spanish. She conducted a semester long research project in Costa Rica and completed an internship at the NIH's National Cancer Institute. She went on to receive her BSN from the Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing in 2004 and her Master's of Nursing Infectious Disease Clinical Nurse Specialist from the University of Washington School of Nursing in 2008. Vanessa worked as an RN2 at the University of Washington Medical Center for five years in the cardiothoracic surgery step down unit and then spent four years as a clinical nurse specialist, medical surgical vascular access in the same hospital for four years. She moved on to become the operations manager for infection control at Harborview in 2013 and was promoted to manager of infection prevention and control in 2018. In her current role, she manages a team of five employees in a department with a $1 million budget in conjunction with the medical director of, infe of infection prevention and control. She provides leadership and program coordination related to safety practices and hospital acquired infection prevention. She also serves as an affiliate instructor at, for the University of Washington School of Nursing and as a participant on the National Association of Clinical Nurses Specialist Infection Control Task Force. Vanessa, thank you for joining us and please take it away. Ooh, oh my goodness. Thank you so much for such a gracious uh, introduction. I am humbled and so excited to come tonight to speak to all of you about uh, the past year experience here at Harborview Medical Center and really the role that I've had uh, throughout the um, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I just want to start off my presentation by acknowledging um, the lands that we are standing on right now. Um, they are the ancestral homelands of those that walked here before us and those who still walk here, keeping in mind the integrity of the uh, territory where area native peoples identify as the Duwamish, the Suquamish, the Snoqualmie, and the Puyallup, as well as the tribes of the Muckleshoot, Tulalip, and other Coast Salish people and their descendants. Um, I'm so privileged to live here in uh, Seattle. I've been here for, I think, almost 17 years, and I can't wait for my next 17. It's a phenomenal place to be, and if you haven't made it out here yet, please come on by. I'll show you once we open up uh, all the great places uh, this region has to offer. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure I can toggle first. Um, I took a little liberty with the trailblazing title here, but this is my uh, information. We'll also have that. I welcome anyone, if anyone wants to get in touch with me after this presentation, to please go ahead and email me. Um, and if you don't hear back from me, just keep emailing me. It's okay to dog me. Um, I have a, still about 4,000 emails in my inbox unread um, from this past year, so no worries there. Um, so to start off and to set the stage of this presentation, uh, this is actually my first presentation talking to people about my experience. And um, it's been very therapeutic to put this presentation together for you all. Um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of emotion um, that has gone into developing this presentation. And um, I hope that you can see this as we move through. Uh, one of my, uh, again, another Washington College alumni, Colleen Moore, or Whitlock, her married name, on March 5th, uh, sent this text to me. 
Nessie, thinking of you on the front lines of this coronavirus craziness, thankfully I know you've been pre preparing for this your whole life for this moment. And we're washing our hands like crazy. Stay healthy. I don't know, Phil, if we actually chose today for a reason, but it was serendipitous. Um, but 365 days ago was probably the hardest week of my entire life. And on this anniversary, when Colleen sent me this message, we had just uh, brought a family member into the ICU to say goodbye uh, to the dad. The son came in to say goodbye to the dad. Uh, we had multiple um, patient admissions from Life Care Center in Kirkland. I mean, every five minutes the phone was ringing. Can you accept this patient? This patient's coming. Um, everyone trying to be safe, uh, trying to figure out where to place them. How are we going to do this? And right when she texted me, I actually had to get up and leave our command center uh, right before the text. And I went outside just to take a breather because the amount of stress was just so overwhelming. And then she texted this to me and I lost it. I had to walk around the block a while. Um, but it truly is something that I've been preparing for my entire life. As you can see there on the slide, there is a um, collection of family disease investigations from Cape Verville's CNW class 102 um, that I have held on to uh, since graduation. It was, sorry, Dr. Knotten, I kind of threw a lot of your stuff out, but you know, so sorry, next time. <laughs> But I held on to this because I thought it was just an interesting collection of everyone in that class's investigation of uh, interviews they had with their grandparents. And it's just fascinating how much has progressed to where I am today and how many things have influenced me to be where I am. I'm just going to read you a couple excerpts from my interview with my grandfather, Charles McCarowitz. Uh, he was born on August 22nd, 1918, in the midst of an influenza epidemic in the United States. He was born in a small rural town, Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. McCarowitz remembered 10 years after his birth, another epidemic of influenza ravished the country, even hitting his small rural town. When we went to school, each kid had to wear a bag over their mouths filled with ichthal. And I still don't know what that is, but we're just going to let that go for protection. It had a god awful smell, but that's what we need to do to ensure our safety. This type of protection wasn't uncommon for the schools to mandate. McCarowitz's wife, Catherine, who was born and raised in Hartford, Connecticut, also remembered wearing a mask filled with ichthal in her classrooms as well. It wasn't anything to joke about, she stated. The scariest feeling of this disease was, McCarowitz said, that we had no idea where it came from or what caused it. At first, we thought it was the well water in the town. Everyone drank it and everyone got sick. So that's where we pointed the finger first. Then that was proven wrong. And we turned to the smog and the pollu uh, pollution from the coal mines in the town. I'm sure that was a problem for other diseases, but not influenza. To this day, McCarowitz did, doesn't have any idea what caused the sickness. However, he remembered lining up to get vaccinated. We never questioned any side effects of the vaccine, nor did we know what we put into our bodies. We just know, we just knew we needed it to survive. Ooh, whoop, whoop, sorry. <laughs> and then I'll just conclude here. My last paragraph was, if there was to be another epidemic today, would we treat it the same way we did in the early century? Would our children go to school with bags around their necks? Would families be held quarantined for days on end? Of course, we cannot answer these questions right now, but it would be interesting, be interesting to see the 90s reaction to an influenza epidemic like the one in the early 1900s. Yikes. I think we figured out what happened. It was just interesting, Vanessa, in 18-year-old Vanessa writing this. And here we are. This class I took at Washington College set the stage for my entire career. I got really into infectious diseases. My roommates, my swim team members, they all can vouch for that. Vanessa was definitely into the microbes and it has carried on uh, throughout 
my career. Um, I got into nursing real quick uh, because my senior year, my mom asked me what my job was going to be. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's a good question, you know, trying to figure it out, mom. And uh, I had a um, college friend of mine, uh, Megan McMahon, who's Megan, Megan McMahon Coco now. Um, she went to uh, nursing school and she wrote to me, she said, Vanessa, the University of Washington, Seattle, Washington has a program with infectious disease nursing. You should become a nurse. I said, okay. So I applied, I got in. Then I applied again for my master's and I told them, if you don't accept me now, you're going to accept me next year or the following year. So they, they gave in and they let me in and, uh, I'm forever grateful for Megan's guidance on that, as well as my mom, uh, to tell me to get a job. So I thought that was great. Um, so yeah, I really have been preparing my whole life for this moment. And I think a lot of people early in the pandemic talked about, oh, this is what healthcare, this is what you sign up for. Sure. We never really thought it was going to happen to us, right? In infectious disease, we continually have been preparing for something like this, but no one can really be 100% prepared for what was down the road. I uh, just want to introduce you a little bit to my facility. Uh, this is Harborview Medical Center. Um, I'm actually right up here in this kind of top of the uh, center tower here. Uh, it's part of the oldest part of the hospital. We expand a couple of blocks here. Um, Harborview Medical Center is part of UW Medicine, which services a five state region including Alaska, Washington, Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. That's about 24% of the U.S. landmass. Um, and we are the only uh, level one trauma hospital within that region. And then UW Medicine is also comprised of three other um, uh, acute care facilities, including UW Medical Center, Montlake, Northwest Hospital, and Valley Medical Center as well as Airlift Northwest, uh, School of Medicine, and our neighborhood clinics. So we have a great system here uh, to provide very excellent and safe care to all our patients that come through our doors. Uh, this is my team. This is the infection prevention team. Uh, we have Dr. John Lynch there, uh, who really has been leading our COVID response for youth of medicine since the beginning. Dr. Chloe Bryson Khan is our uh, Assistant Medical Director for Infection Prevention and Antimicrobial Stewardship. Myself, Nathan, who is an epidemiologist, MPH. Bonnie Decker, who's uh, a nurse as well as an MPH and infection preventionist. Krista Reitberg, and also an MPH epidemiologist. Carol Kamango, uh, who is an RN and an infection preventionist and an epidemiologist. And then we have Jeannie Chan, who's our pharmacist that works with us. And then I have to include our avocado. You can see him sitting back there behind me. Um, he played a pivotal role in our resilience as we've made it through the past 365 days. We're just gonna acknowledge the avocado real quick. Uh, prior to COVID-19, Harborview Medical Center uh, has been designated an assessment and treatment facility for the Ebola virus disease. Um, this is a couple of pictures up at, of us in 2014 with the West African Ebola outbreak. Um, another thing my mom told me, she said, well, if you're going to go into infectious diseases, you can't do Ebola. You can't do biohazard level four. You can't do any of that. So I actually focused on diarrheal diseases because I thought, you know, that could still have a really big impact on uh, the mortality of patients around the world. Um, but don't ever tell your kids that they can't do something because in 2014, I was nine months pregnant dealing with um, our first patient under investigation or PUI uh, for Ebola virus disease. So there you go. Um, so I led a team back in 2014 uh, and we were fortunate enough to acquire a federal grant um, in order to sustain our preparations so between the years of 2014 and 2020, um, I led our special pathogen team. And as you can see there on the uh, right side of the screen, as our PPE evolved, we ran drills, we had biannual training, um, and Glenn is holding up uh, these fantastic checklists. 
And I can't say anything more about checklists other than please use them. Always use them. They're there to keep us safe. Um, and then you can see Ray down there, we went to some special training with the National Ebola Training and Education Center over in Spokane, Washington at the Davenport Hotel, which is a very fancy hotel. And there he is checking out and everyone went crazy because they're like, what is he doing? But we were training just in the ballroom uh, behind us. So, um, so I think we were extremely fortunate at Harborview uh, to have this preparation. We had PPE available. Um, we had some PPE stores ready for pandemics. Um, and uh, we had checklists. We already knew how to don and doff. Our special pathogen team was comprised of about 100 individuals, ranging from nurses to surgeons, anesthesiologists, OR technicians, that have been preparing for the past five years. And that really, I think, gave us a leg up because we kind of, we weren't starting from the bottom, which is helpful for us. So here we are, March 6, 2021. Uh, this has been uh, going around on the internet uh, recently that, you know, a year ago, this was our last normal week and no one knew it. My experience is a little bit different. I was watching everyone not knowing it, but I had been watching a tractor trailer coming straight at us and there was really nothing we could do about it other than prepare. So my story really starts and stops only in this very short period between January of 2020 and about May of 2020. Um, I just pulled this off the uh, Department of Health website this morning. Uh, you can see that we had uh, three uh, surges here in Washington State. Our initial one, which I'm going to be spending most of my time talking about, uh, then another one in July, um, and then uh, recently, really, this was Thanksgiving, and so much travel occurring people coming and going. Um, so I'm going to start here on the timeline. Again, another, um, an another thing that was ominous that occurred, um, we had weekly meetings, or we have actually daily meetings now, but we had weekly meetings that we would sit around and talk about infectious diseases within our group. And we would send out these situation reports to our um, facility, to our staff to update them on what's happening. Uh, both locally, regionally, um, uh, nationally, as well as internationally. And I remember this discussion very vividly. All of us are sitting around. Krista goes, well, should we put in this pneumonia that's occurring in China? And I remember all of us looking around and we go, sure, why not? So this was, um, this was published probably early January of 2020. 59 cases of unknown viral pneumonia reported in central China. Outbreak started late December. Uh oh, can you still hear me? My back? Okay. Um, started late December while it was still unknown what is causing pneumonia, SARS, MERS, and avian flu have not been ruled out. It switched my camera, sorry, going down. <laughs> you can see here the World Health Organization. Um, no deaths, Wuhan, Hubei province, investigations underway. We're closely monitoring the situation. Then January 21st happened and I got this text at 535. Uh, this is from Krista Arganchona, who's the nurse manager for the special pathogen unit over in Spokane, uh, Sacred Heart, which is our region 10 uh, designated uh, assessment and treatment facility. Did you hear Prob Everett has a rule out case? I'm like, what? So I just texted Sarah, because we have a really small community of infection preventionists. Um, she said, oh no, it was negative. And I'm like, no, I just woke up. I actually thought at first that it was an Ebola case. And I was like, this is not making sense because we had just done a huge drill in December around Ebola and Krista was involved and Sarah was involved. And so it wasn't making sense to me. And then it hit me. Yep, this would be the first US case. And as you can see there, this is happening so fast. The next day, Sarah, who's the infection preventionist up at uh, Prov Everett, texted me this at 4.03 PM. If we needed to transfer there, how much time do you think it would realistically to take to open your unit? 
I'm like, well, I'm at the dentist. Okay, I'm going to text you. And I'm like, is this a hypothetical question or is this actually going to happen? Uh, they ended up keeping uh, patient one up in uh, Everett there. Um, but we actually spent the next couple of days trying to figure out how to run his labs. Uh, we were, um, they were only doing point of care testing at the bedside. And so we actually transported blood down to Harborview here to run um, his uh, complete blood count or his chemistries because uh, their lab wasn't capable of doing it at that time. And of course, everyone knows about this, uh, but our Snohomish County man was the first uh, known US case of this new virus. And at the time on January 22nd, this was the case count of uh, COVID-19 at um, about 6 p.m. There was only 550 cases worldwide, including 16 healthcare workers and 17 deaths. So we went right into motion. Um, January 27th, which was what, five days later, uh, we deployed here a home assessment team through Harborview Medical Center to go out and test uh, folks that met criteria in order to um, decrease the amount of resources that were needed if the patient had come into the hospital. Um, as you can imagine, there is a lot going on with isolation and PPE and how many people and how much resource that takes is extremely heavy. So we went out, we uh, rented these white UW minivans, Dodge Caravans, they were fantastic. Um, and this was a picture of our first um, visit. And um, I got to put all of that together myself. Uh, what supplies we needed, who was gonna be part of the team, how, how can we do these checklists? And I remember coming in on the Saturday, which was the 25th or so, just working um, the checklist. How am I gonna get my staff in and out of someone's house? How are we gonna do that safely? Um, you can see here, James uh, was one of our first um, RNs going into the uh, house. He was accompanied by John Lynch, our medical director. Um, and so, it just shows how much our team has invested in the safety and the protocols of everyone here at UW Medicine and even worldwide. We were the first ones to do it ourselves, to go into these houses before we even brought it to the bedside. So John and I always say, everyone's safety, our staff, our patient safety is our number one priority. And there's never anything that we have put into policy or protocol that we wouldn't have done ourselves. And to that day, that's true. Uh, but James was one of our first ones. And he had a, I had a long whirlwind 40 hours and three days of work. As I sit on my couch, beer in hand, all I can think of is how proud I am to be a nurse and to work among the greatest caregivers in the world. Harborview rises every time, each time. Sometimes people ask me why I volunteered for this madness. And I immediately respond, I'm a nurse. I take care of sick people. And it was just the amount of support from our teams here uh, and from our community was huge and palpable. And it's something that I'll never forget. So this is what it looked like. Um, it actually is a, I think a seven page document in Word uh, that talked about all of our different checklists. And this is what I made um, that Saturday here by myself as I was collecting supplies. Um, I just think this layout was um, genius. Uh, this is going in and out of someone's house. Um, I can't just have you walk out. I'm worried about contamination. I'm worried about, you know, um, potentially contaminating the other people on the team. Um, and luckily, most of the um, folks that we went to visit had a garage, which was the first thing that we were so grateful because it was so cold and so rainy that first night. Uh, we did two house visits then and everyone had a garage. So one, we weren't calling too much attention to ourselves, but also we had a nice, safe, warm place to doff or take off our PPE. And this is what the checklist looked like. Um, we had 17 steps to get out of someone's house. And as you can see, checklists are gonna evolve over the time here uh, through my presentation. And then January 29th happened. Um, we were out on a call. We went to go 
see a uh, patient who was uh, being quarantined in a hotel in South Seattle. Uh, we got into the car and uh, John got the phone call. Hey, we have someone in house. There's someone in an emergency department right now that needs to get ruled out. Um, so we basically drove like bats out of hell back to Harborview. It was like 5 p.m. traffic through downtown Seattle. And uh, we have an emergency ramp uh, where the ambulances go up to drop um, the patients off as they come in. And we took that Dodge Caravan and just right up the ramp, jumped out. Me and John jumped out. And then uh, here we were in the emergency department with our team going smoothly, just like our drills. This was probably one of my second proudest moments uh, is that people actually could do the protocols, the things that we have trained for that I was responsible for creating. Um, and it's just, it was just phenomenal. And then we fast forward a couple more days to February 5th. There's John. This is that conference room that I was saying that we meet in. Um, this is the day our team realized, here comes the truck. How are we gonna get people prepared, understand what a pandemic introduction looks like? We were on the precipice of all of these cases. We were on the precipice of what my grandparents had gone through and how are we gonna get through it? Um, words can't describe. Uh, between February 5th uh, and the next month through throughout the end of in a couple weeks of February there, um, I would have just anxiety dreams. Um, I would wake up in the middle of the night thinking, where are we gonna get our PPE? How are we gonna train all these people to take care of an influx of 500, 600 patients. Where are we gonna put them? Do we have enough ventilators? This is what was going on in my head uh, because as the manager, uh, as operations, um, this is what I was in charge of. And really, how am I going to tell the people at the bedside that they are safe? With the protocols that I developed, obviously in conjunction with my team, but really those words are my words. And if I can't keep my people at the bedside safe, how am I gonna have them trust me for the next two years, three years through this pandemic? This nurse's station here, um, this is our uh, COVID acute care floor. So these are folks that are uh, not needing intensive care. Um, Cause we actually thought, well, we could handle everyone in, you know, in ICU. Well, obviously that wasn't gonna last long. So we had to expand out. These nurses were not part of our special pathogen team. Um, they knew infection control cause luckily our team uh, really works to, to establish relationships with our frontline workers, but they had no idea what was coming to them. I stood in that nurse's station at 10 p.m., at 5 a.m., explaining to them what was gonna happen next. And the weight of having everyone's safety, not only the, the staff, but the patients on my shoulders is something just you cannot imagine. I couldn't, I, it's the first time I've ever had anxiety attacks. Um, my heart just beating fast. I'm like, what is going on? I'm a pretty easy going person. But I was so concerned because we didn't really know transmission. Was it fomite? Was it air? What's happening? And that rested on my shoulder and the shoulders of my team. These people are the backbone of our operations. Uh, the acute, the, everyone focuses on the ICU, but the acute care areas are chugging along. They admit people, they rule out people, they discharge people, people die. Um, and this team here on Fort East has just taken it all in stride. You can see they're still smiling 365 days later. Their turnover rates are actually quite low because everyone has such a supportive team there. It's just phenomenal. This was just a couple of days ago, so I realized I didn't have a photo of them. This is also what happened in February. Um, 
we had an intake form from the Department of Health. Testing was so limited. Um, you had to meet all these criteria before you would even be considered for testing. And then if you were considered for testing, we had to send out to the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia. We didn't get results for like a week. It was incredible. So trying to keep people at home um, was important in doing the testing at home. Um, we, in our command center, I'll show you here in a second, uh, we did start a tally and it stopped right there because COVID kicked our butts. <laughs> Just there, there was too many in the COVID category, so we actually did erase it. But one day we had a win and it was great. Um, so here's just some fun memes. February 19th, this is what the situation was here in the United States. There was only 15 positives, 52 pending. Here in Washington, we had, again, our one uh, patient zero here. We had our PUI who was uh, here at Harborview Medical Center and only a couple, you know, uh, tested or, or, or negative. But we were monitoring almost a thousand people. So that's incredible. And then the last week of February occurred. Um, February 25th, uh, the Helen Chu lab, who's the Washingtonian of the year, Helen Chu is a, um, a, a physician here at UW Medicine, uh, working with uh, influenza over the past several years. Uh, she ran uh, the Seattle flu study uh, that had in-home testing for folks throughout flu seasons. You could get tested, send it in, see what you have. Uh, she continued to do that. People continued to sign up. Um, but she, on the back end, was also testing for uh, COVID. UW Virology, unsung heroes of this uh, pandemic. Uh, they developed a test extremely early on. Here in February, uh, they were able to um, monitor on the back end whether there was a coronavirus circulating in our community. Uh, but unfortunately, they uh, couldn't publish any of these because uh, the FDA did not allow or did not approve their tests. But in any case, she went rogue. That's a whole nother story, a whole nother lecture she can give you. Um, and she identified the first community case. On the 26th, we had a patient from a skilled nursing facility or SNF die at our hospital. At the time, we did not know uh, that they had coronavirus because of um, absence of testing or even fitting the epidemiological um, form that we needed to meet all those criteria for the CDC. February 28th, we had a handful of patients from the skilled nursing facility admitted. Uh, they ended up testing positive for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and uh, February 29th, we had our first community case uh, through one of our home assessment teams. March 3rd, it was determined that the prior death from the SNP was um, uh, uh, related to COVID-19, uh, resulted in a large exposure to our staff and to other patients here. And we activated our emergency command center. And then finally on March, I think it was March 2nd or yeah, probably the 3rd, um, CDC and FDA opened up uh, for testing. So you can test everyone. You don't have to go through that piece of paper to see uh, who's coming from the Hubei province. And that's where we were. Uh, you all are aware of uh, probably what happened in Life Center, Kirkland. Um, I think I can get to this website. Let's see. Uh, and I don't have the audio here. Can you see the website? Thank you, okay. But what I want to do, they have a great timeline here. Um, it, but you can see in this one uh, column is announced cases and then deaths to date. And you can see their timeline on the left hand side. I just want to show you what this looks like. So they had two deaths February 26, two deaths February 27. Um, to me, this is very eerie and very scary. Um, then they started diagnosing February 29th, they had three more deaths. Then March 1st, six new positives, seven deaths. And you can just see uh, how devastating this virus was for this um, skilled nursing facility. And when I talk about all those patients coming in 
at the beginning with Colleen's text. I mean, it was phone call after phone call. Here's another one. We're bringing you another one. And basically our um, emergency uh, responders would just go pick up the patients and bring and they're we're like, how, how far out are you? And they're like, we're right outside your door. That's how it felt. Um, and it was just incredible. Okay, so let me just see, can I go back to, oh, I've tried to practice this before, Phil. <laughs> March 2nd, we had our second death. Um, and with the launching of our emergency um, operation command center, uh, on March 5th, we started testing our staff for COVID. Um, and this is a picture of, we had a whole little kind of pop-up clinic set up in one of our buildings. Um, and this sun balloon, again, is another highlight of my time in the past 365 days. We had an analyst that was helping me figure out how to schedule, how to get the supplies, what's the workflow of telling the employees, hey, you have to come in the back way. Um, and I said, we need a balloon to like show them where the driveway is. And um, I said that like early in the morning and then by 5 p.m. here comes Victor with this sunshine balloon from the gift shop and I just lost it. I think I cried, I hugged him. Um, it was just such a great small thing that someone did in order to uh, really convey, hey, we care about you, come this way. So our incident management system here, um, you know, we have our instant commander, um, and a bunch of different um, folks that contribute uh, to the success of our operations. You have an operation lead, a planning lead, a logistics finance, and then you have your safety liaison, public information. And then we added something in here called medical technical, which was really led um, by Dr. Lynch and the other infectious disease doctors of our area hospitals. So of University of Washington, Montlake, Northwest and Valley. Um, and then it was very soon after uh, the initiation, I think I went to John, I go, John, where are the nurses at? And he's like, oh, guess what? Now you are part of this. And I'm like, oh, great, thanks. Um, so luckily bringing the voice of uh, not just the medical profession, but nursing and all ancillary staff um, to the decisions that are being made at this very high level. We also have great partnerships here in Washington State uh, with our uh, public health departments, Seattle King County, our Northwest Healthcare Response Network. I had been working with them those previous five years for Ebola virus disease. We've established relationships um, and really having everyone come together to support each other. Um, without the entire community, even our area hospitals that are not part of University of Washington, such as Virginia Mason, Swedish, Evergreen, over in Kirkland there. Um, like I said, it's a small knit community. Uh, not everyone goes into infection control, um, you know, but uh, we all supported each other uh, in order to get us through this. Uh, these are just a couple of pictures of our command center when we actually could meet up with each other and talk to each other without masks. We had food um, and we just worked. That's all we did was work. Um, I'd come home late at night, uh, get up before my kids got up and uh, we just kept, kept going, trying to keep everyone safe. I love this picture of myself down here because everyone's like, I had some feedback. People are like, look at that guy yelling at her. And actually the situation was, I was yelling at him to get me the PPE now. And he's like, wait for this, so wait a second. Whoa, whoa, that's what he was doing. I'm like, no, I don't wanna hear it. I need the PPE now. Um, so it's, I just think it's a funny photo because it can be told so many different ways. We were keeping counts of COVID folks on pieces of paper. This is a picture of what John would fill out each day. Okay, what did every hospital have? How many PUIs or patients under investigation? How many tests? Look, you have UW neighborhood clinics, 112 tests done yesterday, yes. Now we have like 500 done a day, if not more. Um, so just incredible how we went from here actually to a dashboard. So analytics 
came in uh, big time for our command center. I'm also proud of this. This is a, uh, it didn't really catch on. We tried to get it on Twitter, uh, but John uh, named, uh, I guess, a, a, a public health or epidemiological unit of measure after me called the McCarowitz unit or the MAC unit. Um, we were really having a hard time with our PPE because the testing took so far away. It was like, you know, five to seven days turnaround time. That means you're burning your PPE, right? So you have so many times you're in and out of the rooms. So you're wasting a mask, you're wasting a gown every time we don't have that negative result. Um, and so that's a MAC unit. So how long it takes from time of testing to release from precautions. Again, we try to take it to Twitter. Some people picked up on it, but it, it's just kind of fun, I guess. Um, and then I'll also just see over here, the flatten the curve, right? We've all heard it, but really this was our guiding light. Our goal, we knew people were coming, but we, and we knew we didn't have the resources. Our gowns supply were running low. Our masks were running low. Um, so we wanted this flattened curve so we could absorb it all. Um, this high, heightened curve scared us uh, beyond measure. And so if you remember, here's our little team. We are the experts. We are a team of what, 10, five, oh, avocado, was that nine plus avocado? And we have to teach everyone rapidly how to be safe when dealing with this pathogen. We had our special pathogen team and our disaster plan was to then mobilize this 100 plus team out to teach. And that's actually what happened. Um, our clinical education or uh, nursing development and uh, professional education, nursing education and professional development, all the clinical educators got on board, learned how to don and doff. They took that off my plate. So instead of me doing the classes, they're like, we got this, Vanessa. They had been training with me for the past five years. So they knew the rigor that I expect people to take off their PPE. We have a uh, saying here, what the hell gel? You can see behind me, wash your hands, Harborview. Um, I have people gelling their hands multiple times when taking off their PPE um, because I'm so concerned that if you remove your goggles, would your gloves go into your eyes? Could that be a transmission risk? As you're taking off your N95 respirator, what happens if it kicks back on you and now you have whatever was on the outside of your mask up front. So basically we mobilized all of our resources um, after working two night shifts, um, just trying to make sure operations were going smoothly, patient flow was go going smoothly. I joined incident command in the morning and I said, we need a charge nurse for COVID flow only. Now we were getting all these COVID folks but we were also getting traumas. We are the only level one trauma facility in a five state region. People are still having car accidents. People were still mountain biking. All the things were still having strokes. We we're a stroke center. Every, all of that was still happening and COVID was on top of this. So we developed the COVID ops RN role. Uh, those were our COVID charge nurses. We called them corns. I thought that was kind of fun. Um, and we have something very special here at Harborview and UW Medicine, our trained observers or TOs. Uh, this was a vestige from our Ebola preparations and something that I feel has been probably one of the most impactful safety nets for all of our providers is to have a trained observer watch you put on your PPE, check your PPE before you go into the room, and then help you get out of that PPE when you leave the room. So this person's reading that checklist line by line and taking off and watching their partner take off the PPE to avoid contamination. We had our COVID ICU, our acute care, our emergency department, uh, just they've seen every single COVID person in and out and uh, they're all still here, uh, which is great. Our OR and ambulatory services. So we had to delegate 
we had to make experts extremely quickly um, and it happened. These are just a couple of photos from uh, the ICUs here. Uh, this is very early on in the pandemic. You can see I've only had four things on the wall or on the door. <laughs> Today there's like 20. Um, I know there's sign fatigue, but uh, they're all necessary for different procedures. Um, this was March 19th. Uh, our COVID ICU is actually our neurocritical care ICU. Um, I think it has about 30 beds in it uh, for our stroke and other um, neurospecialty patients. Uh, and we started closing each wing of it down little by little. This was March 19th. We had shut down a whole half of the unit to prep it for COVID patients. Uh, this is the central part of the unit. It is usually bustling. It is loud. It is noisy. There's people around. I went there on March 19th and there was nobody there. It was an eerie silence. And again, what was to come? Uh, it's just incredible. Very just scary. Oh, and this is what our checklist looked like now. So if you remember that seven page document, um, we've gotten it down to uh, one page for taking off our PPE. But you can see here, we have conventional pathway, contingency pathway for goggles and contingency pathway for full face shields. Like I said, PPE was one of, and still is the most vulnerable part of this entire response. Our supply chain just couldn't keep up and neither could our nation. I mean, the whole globe is looking for gloves and gowns and masks and eye shields. And so depending on what our supply looked like, depended on how we mitigate either extended use of our supply or reuse. So extending um, the amount of time you're wearing a mask or having to reuse your respirator multiple times. Uh, and again, this is where I came in to be the subject expert on ensuring that uh, how we did this was done safely. And this is all I could remember or remember going through during these times, uh, looking at what was happening in Italy, going, okay, is tomorrow going to be the day that this is going to be Harborview, this is going to be Seattle. And we had reports, Henry Ford system here, 282 patients with COVID-19 Wednesday morning. By afternoon, it was 304, with another 107 patients suspected waiting on results. And of course, uh, what occurred over in New York City, um, I have, my heart goes out to each and every frontline worker there of the amount of uh, folks uh, that they had influx as well as um, uh, the mortality of these patients. So I got to do some cool things in hindsight about what happened around that time in March. Um, we looked for makers. So uh, who could make masks? Who can make N95s? Who can make gowns? Um, I got to reach out to Feathered Friends, which is an outdoor um, company here. They outfit folks doing a extreme mountain climbing. So they have great down suits up there on Mount Everest. I got to talk to them. Uh, we talked to REI, uh, Nordstrom, you know, how can, can you have any raw materials to make what we need? And that's what it was. We just, there was just not even raw material. Uh, we had local designers. We had Tim Prestero here from Design That Matters just reach out and said, I want to 3D print you face shields. And this is, I think, this was the first model of this 3D printed face shield that I think is everywhere in the United States. And it started here, which is phenomenal. That's Gwen, one of our ED nurses, um, modeling it for us. Um, but we went through a whole bunch of iterations of the face shield. Um, a lot of people have them just kind of down here, but it's not protecting droplets from coming inside. So that's why we had this kind of like visor uh, design. Um, I worked with Victory Lundquist from StopTheBug.org. Uh, she is a local uh, firefighter up in Snoqualmie. Um, I met her mom. Her mom came and brought me stuff, um, such as, I'm going to show you, such as like these Tyvek gowns that were made of like farming material. They said, hey, try this out. Would this work? We can have people make this for you. I'm like, sure, let's do it. Um, 
also were running out of um, respirator hoods that hook up to machines. So we worked with the local um, VA here. Uh, they had a couple of engineers that um, engineered a brand new hood um, that uh, could fit our papper machines so we could have more hoods to wear because there's just not enough material out there. We had to become innovative. Oh yeah, here's just one more thing I'll show you. Um, here's an N95 respirator. We had a local company making up a HEPA filter with a 3D printed mask. And these would be interchanged and you could throw out the mask. So a lot of innovation um, and collaboration occurred uh, during this time in March. And these are just pictures of what our staff had to go through with uh, reusing uh, their N95s. If you can imagine you were in a COVID positive room, you have this respirator N95 mask on, I need you to use that five more times before I can give you a new one. Sometimes in New York, they had one respirator for weeks on end. Luckily, we were able to uh, have a five time limit. But you would go into that room, you would come out, and then you're like, how am I not gonna contaminate this inside? right? And now I'm gonna have to put that back on my face. So we have the infamous brown bags with uh, 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 straws that would hang um, there to support the mask. We had our water pitchers. That was a great one. So that fit very nicely down in there. And then we had our takeout trays that you could put your straps on the outside and your mask set inside. And people had to redon this every day, every about five more times for the shift. Uh, and it was just incredible. We also uh, worked with the University of Nebraska. We kind of just stole their idea about reprocessing our N95 respirators through UVC disinfection. This uh, machine here is a UVC light machine. We actually use it to clean rooms. It's kind of like a a scan of the room at the end of cleaning that helps ki kill Clostridium difficile, my diarrheal bug friend. Um, and we started using Trudy in order to uh, decontaminate our masks. So at the end of the day, we would collect them all. We would hang them in this OR room. We'd set Trudy to burn for about 40, uh, it was like 15 minutes or so. Um, turn the carts around so it could disinfect the other side and then it would go back into distribution. So Dr. Connaughton may get my mask tomorrow and I may get Dr. Connaughton's mask tomorrow. Obviously we threw out the, the ones that either had a lot of makeup on or had boogers in them, um, but that's what we had to do. That's how uh, restraint our supply system was. And something that it was exciting that came out um, of all of this kind of doom and gloom um, part of our PPE um, donning was uh, to make sure your scrub pants didn't drag on the floor. And this came from our home assessment um, trips in which John came out of one house and I was there stopping it. I'm like, your cuffs are on the, you were just in this person's house. I don't know what that person's been doing. And now you got to get in that Dodge Caravan with me with your cuff all covid -y. So I'm like, you better tuck those cuffs. And so it became a thing. Um, these are our COVID socks. It started to become a competition who could have the coolest socks. Um, we actually, uh, one of our uh, nurses here, Katie, Katie Harmon, uh, created an Instagram account. You can follow her at COVID socks on Instagram. Um, it became kind of our MO here at Harborview. It was some levity. In, um, in sight of so much despair. Uh, so then we got socks donated to us. I got some really awesome socks uh, that I'm so grateful for because it was a light amid a lot of darkness. Uh, yeah, we're still in March. Can you believe all this is happening? It's like, you know, COVID years are like 10 years from now, right? Uh, we had two emergency doctors over at um, Evergreen uh, in critical condition with uh, coronavirus. And this is the week all of our schools closed um, and things shut down. Um, we have a, my family and I love to go to this bar 
uh, called Hattie's Hat down in Ballard. It's a neighborhood in, here in Seattle. And um, we went to go pick up our takeout that night. The kids are in the back. And I just remember this picture of just everyone boarding up everything, just boarding up everything. And it just literally just shut down. And I'm sure that's exactly what happened in the areas where you are. This is downtown Seattle. We had a great office building giving us a little heart. This is a view right from Harborview down the street. Um, and there's no one out. This was one of the busiest intersections here up on uh, First Hill in Seattle. There's just nobody. And it was eerie. It made the commute faster. I could get in from my house to Harborview in like 10 minutes, which was great. Um, but it was, it was quiet. And then we also had um, in May here, uh, one of our ICU nurses pass. Uh, resulting from complications of COVID-19. Uh, he had uh, acquired COVID-19 most likely from a patient that was unknown to us of having the disease until uh, the patient really decompensated, sparking um, testing. And then um, he, Alex, uh, contracted since then. Um, and I'm just gonna read this little uh, blurb. This is located on Kaiser Health News um, about him. Uh, I should send out some links, Phil, to everybody, but uh, this link here, Loss on the Frontline from Kaiser Permanente is phenomenal. They highlight all the frontline workers um, that have died uh, over the past year uh, with phenomenal uh, bios of them. So it hit one of our own, and this was prior to our masking mandate this was prior to us requiring masks anytime you're interacting with a patient or eye protection anytime you're interacting with a patient. Uh, this was early, early April. Uh, we had just um, switched uh, to mandated masking about a week after he contracted COVID-19. So Alexander Volman, known as Alex to friends and family, honed his caregiving skills as an army medic and his discipline as an honor guard at the tomb of the unknown soldier. But the 57 year old intensive care nurse in Seattle found his true passion at the bedside of sick children and burn patients. He told me he would never leave here, said Melvin Tam, who worked with Volman for more than a decade. He found a home. In April, Volman contracted COVID-19, possibly from a patient. He was hospitalized twice with the virus and recovered. He was ready to return to work when he collapsed during an errand at Costco, days before his 58th birthday. He died of a probable heart attack complicated by blood clots related to COVID-19 records show. The COVID compromised him, said his older sister, Jackie Martin. People that recover, they don't recover completely, and he didn't. More than 100 people attended Volman's memorial service at the hospital. He was remembered as a talented chef, a devoted owner of two cats, Aziz and Kalali, and an exceptional nurse. Hospital officials issued a statement mourning his loss. There was so much love, Martin said. This really was his family. So I just want to honor Alex here. Um, he is always in my thoughts. I have a, his picture uh, up on my wall right next to the balloon. Uh, right in front of my desk. So every time I think things are getting tough, I look up and I see him and I go, we just got to keep moving forward. So I appreciate him more than he'll ever know. Um, and then I just gonna, I know I'm over time a little bit, Phil, almost at the end here, but um, we recently just got this, um, I guess it's more like a poem of sorts from Katie, uh, Katie Ellis, who is an administrative specialist down at Public Health Seattle, King County. Um, and I think she just published it to us a couple of days ago and I just wanna read it to you all because it captures so much of what I have gone through um, in this PowerPoint um, more eloquently uh, than I could explain. So beginning at the local public health department, even when we see it coming, as maps grow red day by day, commas catch breath between zeros 
Numbers expand their fields, fields we don't see. It arrives from the Pacific like handfuls of sparks on a path of dry pine needles. The first death in the United States happens on the county line north of us. Our office hive buzzes with flyer ins from Georgia. We meet people from our neighboring sections on the org chart we knew, never knew existed. Our phone number tapped like an SOS signal by doctors, travelers, parents, and caregivers seeking answers. But we answer their call with questions and our questions mushroom rapid rattle along corridors leading into packed conference rooms still decorated with pink foil coils and it's a girl streamers. Days begin with a phone call from the hospital up the hill, Harborview. We cry the first time we hear the story we will hear so many times. He was 90 years old and would have passed away surrounded by his wife of 57 years, their children, grands, and greats. Instead, he died with nurses constricted by PPE who stood in for loved ones as best they could, or who stood back respectfully assigned to monitor for touch that breaches protocol in these last cherished visits amid the hum and distant alarms of hospital life. He wrote his wife a love letter that also said goodbye. We imagine shaky but elegant cursive across pages that conjure memories of their first date sharing fish and chips on Pier 54, a reminder to water the geraniums, wishes to hold her hand, to see her face again. We imagine his wife reading her love's last words on paper as if he died at war in an overseas battle. We ask the caller to confirm the death date and to please fax the clinic notes. Headsets bleep with new incoming calls. We are the unseen essential pushers of virtual paper. We cog and tick, select and click. We scour electronic faxes for specimen collection dates for reactive or detected or positive. We comb for cues of death or congregate setting or long-term care. We enter names and birth dates, the combination of which become the identifiers of life. We hope survive the results. Upload attachment, save, exit, open next. If there is time and light, we pull on a sweater, readjust our mask and step outside. We walk to the empty city, dreaming of a home across the water where cedars outlive loss and hold us curled against their trucks, trunks like newborns inhaling the first of countless breaths. And I'll tell you that story of the love letter, I believe occurred 365 days from today. I touched base with the hospitalist that had to read the wife's goodbye letter to the husband and then delivered the goodbye letter from the husband to the wife himself, Dr. Andrew Hahn. And it was amazing because I was talking to him today and he's like, I think that is the most intense emotional experience I will ever have in my career. And we think about it daily. And when Andrew had told us about this, when it occurred, it was just almost too much to handle. And again, this is a story that has replayed multiple times over and over again. Um, and to have a public health department, an administrative specialist that also heard that story just explain in such ex exquisite words is something that really is a true testament to our region and to the care that everyone here in Seattle has taken uh, related to this pandemic. And then to leave on a happy note, I wish I could get this uh, to play, uh, but this was America's grandma for a very short period of time, Geneva Wood. Uh, she was a 90 year old and again I'll send out a link you can hear her story, um, but she was not expected to live. Um, and I was there uh, the day I went down to the unit and I said it's time to clear her and the nurses were so excited, it was a success, it was finally a win. And um, I was down the hallway and all of a sudden I hear a huge roar of clapping and yelling and they had cleared her from the precautions. And uh, it was just, again, another highlight in my early pandemic days. 
so that's where we are, just May 2020. That's just one piece of this entire story um, and the role that I was able to play in our initial response. Uh, we'll save that for next year. We'll go through the whole rest of the year next year. <laughs> Pretty much that's all I can handle for now. Um, our cases ebb and flow. Uh, you can see here, this is uh, UW Medicine patients, uh, acute care, as well as ICU uh, for our system here. We have been very fortunate to really flatten that curve and be able to absorb the amount of patients coming in for our system. Even though it was overwhelming with the amount coming in at the time, uh, we've been able to stretch our PPE through all of our mitigation strategies. We've been able to keep the majority of our staff extremely safe. Our percent positive of employees here is less than what our region is. And um, I, I just, that's the most important to me uh, since my name's attached to all of that. <laughs> Um, and then I'll just, you know, something that we are uh, starting to look at a little bit more, there's been a few um, uh, articles or uh, research studies done about um, racial disparities uh, related to the COVID-19 pandemic. This is just a snapshot here in King County, um, really showing the impacts of uh, non-white uh, folks on uh, the pandemic. Definitely our, um, our Hispanic folks, our um, African American folks, and Asians are definitely being impacted through uh, this infection uh, more so than our white colleagues here. And then, what do what's the future look like? Uh, here we are in January. Oh no, March. I don't even know what whatever month we're in. March 2021. Um, is it over? No. Um, once you're vaccinated, can I just go party? No, depends on who you're partying with, I guess. Um, but we have a long road still ahead of us. All of the interventions, the tactics of masking and social distancing and limiting gathering uh, all still play such an important part in uh, the pandemic here. Again, leaving on a high note, here's December 15th. 2020, we started our first vaccination of our healthcare workers. This is Dr. Tuan Ong, who's uh, an associate professor for gerontology and geriatric medicine. He was one of the physicians going into Life Center, Kirkland, to see the patients, to swab the patients, to the next skilled nursing facility. Him and his team would go and swab and see the, the patients on their last breath. So much death occurred. Uh, within those facilities um, and here's him just after his shot just this this picture sums up everything that i was feeling at the time of just relief and some some hope and finally some light uh, and that's dr tim Dellett, who's our chief medical officer and then here's our team here's our team getting our vaccinations there's john krista myself uh, down here, this is Tim Meeks, our director of uh, uh, psychiatric services, vaccinating his mom. He can't get better than that. And then really to all of the unsung heroes, we talk a lot about physicians and nurses at the bedside, but that's just one small piece of the entire puzzle. The virology lab, the microbiologist, the technicians in the lab that are putting these swabs on hour after hour to get results. Our cleaning crews, our environmental service team, they were one of the first environmental service team that I know of that actually went in, agreed to go into the COVID rooms to clean because actually nurses are really bad at cleaning rooms. We're just not good at it, okay? Our facilities and engineering, the people that kept the cafeteria going so I could have hash browns and eggs every day, our therapies, the supply chain, working overtime to ensure we have every supply, not only PPE, but everything else we need. Security services, spiritual care, pharmacists, phlebotomists, our testing site, all of these people deserve as much credit as nurses and physicians do, is how we keep it moving here. 
And then I'm gonna say thank you, that's it for now. Those are my two children, Henry and Walden. I had to pop them in there somewhere, they're so cute. Um, and there I am, Washington College with Dr. Kyle Geisler. Uh, we were freshman year roommates. Uh, she's now working as a family practice physician in uh, the Chicago area. Here we are hugging, I think that was her last meet. And then here's her and I today, which I think speaks volumes. So thank you. I'll stop there. Thanks for listening. Um, some questions that I had that I thought people were gonna ask were about, um, you know, any lessons learned or, or what's the most important thing you could take away from this experience? And I think, I think it's kind of threefold, threefold answer there. One, um, leadership is key from all levels. Um, we found, particularly when staff started getting, uh, becoming positive, whether it was, again, it's very hard to determine whether you got it from a patient or was it a community exposure, depending on your activities outside of Harborview. Um, we may not have had, I mean, I was there doing Zoom meetings with everybody, but I think having more of a leadership presence and the more presence of people on the same page, like from the managers, um, units that staff were really anxious about, the manager really was, um, maybe they didn't know exactly how to answer the questions, but they were silent versus the managers that were like, okay, we're gonna figure this out. I don't know the answers right now. We're gonna figure it out. Uh, the staff had less anxiety that way. Um, I think coordination um, and relationship building is also huge. Um, none of this could have happened without all those partners I was talking about at other facilities. Um, my relationship with John, our medical director, um, we are a dyad, we call ourselves Bert and Ernie. Um, and he respects me as a nurse, I respect him as a physician and, and uh, we work complimentary of each other to make sure we're checking each other um and having a really great working relationship to to not have like oh i'm the doctor i need to do this or i'm the nurse you don't know what you're talking about doctor you know like it's a very collaborative um relationship we have and our team i mean i've spent more time with them uh than my own family over the past year so those relationships are really important as well so i apparently missed a couple questions that came in on facebook Oh, cool. You have a couple. Um, and I think you might know both of these people because one is Brandy Bratrude. And, Brandy Bratrude. Okay. And would like to know, um, going into year two, what are you focused on incorporating into your workflows with all that you've learned in year one? Um, what I would like to do is um, spend more time with our uh, staff unions. Um, so our union, our, our nurses, our union employees, our environmental services, our union employees, I'd like to spend this year too being more collaborative with them, um, having them at the table, um, having their voices heard. They're there to support the staff, which is totally awesome. Um, but at times it's been very um, head against head without people having the right information. Um, I think we can get further if we work together collaboratively rather than against each other um, in some aspects. Um, I'd like to see that in year two. Um, and I would like people to trust us again. <laughs> that sounds weird, but the internet has so much information. There's so much being published. Uh, there's a lot of buzz feeds. There's a lot of talk on Twitter and um, talk shows and news organizations and all this. There's so much information coming to us that uh, we found a lot of times that, you know, we had to, people just were like, no, we don't believe you. We believe what BuzzFeed said. Um, but I am trained in infectious diseases. John has spent his career learning about this. We have some really intelligent epidemiologists. Um, so I want people to kind of focus back on where they trust their information coming from. Um, that's what I really think uh, year two should be. 
And Dr. Geisler is curious if you have a sense of what percentage of your hospital staff opted out of vaccination. Oh, good job, Kyle. Thanks. Um, we just looked at some of that right now. UW Medicine is trending. Um, and again, it's not those that are totally vaccinated. So our program is either you're vaccinated or you decline vaccination. Those two are put together with our vaccination rates. And uh, those that are, I think, declining or have not been vaccinated yet, we're, I think we're about a 7%. And a lot of people are declining if they are like a child um, bearing age um, or pregnant. A lot of our um, staff are young and um, going through that part of their life. Um, but I think a lot of people uh, kind of deferred their first dose and then our supply ran out or didn't run out. We just weren't a lot in new supply. But we just opened up first doses again and now uh, we definitely got an influx of people coming in. So we're hoping to see that um, declination or de uh, yeah, declination of vaccine uh, decrease as we move forward. And I will just say our um, influenza vaccination rates for UW Medicine, um, I think, again, in compliance with either declining for medical reasons or obtaining, I think we we're at 97% last year. So we have a high rate of vaccination within our staff. So I have a lot of hope. Okay. Um, again, I want to I want to thank you. Is there anything else you want to add before we sign off for the evening? No, I just want to thank all of you. I was had a lot of time, obviously, to reflect. Uh, I thought a lot about Washington College um, over the past couple of weeks. Um, I thought about you, Dr. Kanaten. I thought about Dr. Reville, Dr. Rosemary Ford, um, Dr. Darnowski, uh, Senor Pavon. Um, just so many people uh, that has, have influenced my career and you just didn't even know it. Uh, Dr. Anderson in ethics, I think about you all the time. Dr. Cregan, what's up buddy? Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's amazing to see where you are and where you go and where you continue to go. Um, and I owe Washington College a lot from the relationships that I made um, for the excellent teachers that I had. And uh, you all have shaped me. You all have a part of me to be where I am today. So thank you.